So, hello everyone, I'm Luca Cantarello, I'm a PhD student uh, at the University of Leeds. Um, so I will talk a bit about the work that has been done in Leeds uh, regarding data simulation. And probably this will sound a bit different from the uh, presentations which have been um, given so far. Um, basically because the application that uh, we were interested in is a bit different. So uh, to the, the work in Leeds uh, started um, six, seven years ago. And uh, so I'm creating here many people. And I think one thing that I would like to um, stress is the fact that we have a collaboration with the Met Office. Um, so the application we are interested in is, you might guess, from the Met Office collaboration, weather forecasting. Um, so someone mentioned before, uh, data simulation is used in weather forecasting to basically uh, generate the initial conditions that then are uh, used to run the numerical weather prediction models. So you're probably aware that the uh, atmosphere is a chaotic system. So you need a good, reliable initial condition if you have to, uh, if you want to have a good forecast. Now, the issue with uh, doing research in this field is that the size of the problem is um, quite a thing. Um, so a, a typical numerical weather prediction models can have up to 10 to the 9 degrees of freedom. And when I say degrees of freedom, I mean uh, the dimension of the state vector made of all the variables uh, times all the uh, grid points over which the model is integrated. Um, at the same time, uh, when it comes to assimilate the model data with the observations, we have every hour the potential to assimilate millions of observations. So of course, these can become intractable, slow, expensive when we want to do research in the field. So what we do instead, generally speaking, is um, trying to simplify the problem and using idealized models. Now, idealized models are, are a way to um, a workaround and a way, an alternative to do research in this uh, field. And so the, the two important aspects about uh, idealized models is that they need to be inexpensive, numerically speaking, and that, but also at the same time, they need to retain some link to the real problem or they need to be relevant uh, for the problem which is under consideration. So they, mm, they need to retain some characteristics, core characteristics, essential characteristics that um, um, pertain to the problem studied. Now, in the literature, there are many, many options. Um, um, there are models that people have used, many types of models going from um, simplified versions of operational models to uh, Lorentz models. Um, we went, uh, we decided to do something in between, and so we we use shallow water models. And this is interesting because that means that we are using a fluid dynamics uh, model to do data simulation for water forecasting. And so that was seen as an in between choice between something very close to the operational systems and something very close to something very far from the observation from the operational systems. Okay, so this slide just summarizes what we have done in Leeds. So there is a paper from three years ago in which we have uh, basically described the model that we have developed. And this model is based, as I just said, uh, on a shallow water uh, system of equations. But then we also made some modifications to that model in order for it to mimic convection and precipitation because um, the specific interest in the specific focus of the study was on convective uh, data simulation, convection, uh, data simulation for convection. Um, and once the model was developed, then we ran a, ser a series of experiments um, with an ensemble based data simulation with an ensemble common filter. I will go back to this later. Um, and basically, we, we, we did this round of experiments. Uh, trying to show the relevance of our model for competitive scale numerical weather prediction data simulation. And there is a paper which we are now writing and it's uh, currently under review the Met Office. And more recently, we have also started to do uh, research uh, on this, um, on the satellite data simulation using these, always this uh, idealized approach. Um, and the reason why we are interested in satellite data simulation is because um, basically um, satellites are, are a very important source of observations and also uh, 
um, historically satellites have contributed greatly to the quality of the weather forecast. So since they've been introduced, the weather forecasts have, and the weather forecasting has improved quite a lot. So a few words on the uh, model that we are using. So the model is based on is um, our model is a shallow water models. And for those of you who are not familiar with them, shallow water models are a class of fluid dynamics models in which basically the Navier-Stokes equations are simplified, um, basically integrating them um, over the vertical coordinates. And that's because we generally make the assumption that we have a layer of fluid which is quite um, it's not very deep, uh, especially if compared to the um, size of the uh, horizontal domain or the domain of which this fluid is um, is lying on. Um, so if you look at these um, uh, set of equations below, um, so you see that the uh, variables in this type of models are generally the fluid velocities and the fluid depth. And this is a, a classical rotating shallow water uh, model. Like this, how this is how the equation would generally look like, with P and Q being just um, pressure terms. Uh, now, what we do though, we wanted to get some convection and precipitation, so we have modified this model, and basically have added a system of thresholds. Um, basically, we say that when the model overcomes a certain threshold then the model is doing something different. And the threshold we uh, we put, where we added were two. One was for convection and one was for rain. So basically, uh, it's not important to get all the details here, but when the fluid depth goes over the convection threshold, then we modify these Q and Q terms here, the green terms here. And basically, that, um, that pushes the fluid further up. And then when the, um, the fluid um, depth goes beyond the rain threshold, then we activate a, a, new a whole new equation um, which describes uh, this kind of uh, rain. It's not really rain, it's just a variable which is a proxy for rain. And here on the left, you see, um, you see the, um, basically the correspondence, how this works. So where the fluid goes beyond the rain threshold, you have this uh, production of this kind of uh, rain variable. Now, of course, this is an idealized model, right? So how do you do idealized, how do you do data simulation when you use an idealized model? And the answer is we use a twin setting configuration. And the twin setting configuration basically exploits, in this case, the different, um, the, the, the different resolutions. Um, so exploit the possibility of running the model at different resolutions. So on one side, we run a high resolution deterministic run. Um, which gave us uh, a nature run. So the nature run is basically what we believe is the truth trajectory of the of our system. Um, and from there we derive the observations or so synthetic observations from the nature run. And we did this because we kind of we are trying to mimic what we believe it's happening even in the real system. Um, basically, we believe that the observations in the real world are much closer to the um, real state of the atmosphere than the model, um, than the for than a forecast. And then to get the forecast, we run the same model but at a lower resolution, and we run an ensemble of forecast uh, states, and that's that's and and that allows us to basically combine the two in an ensemble common filter. So that's how it works, and also on the, on the left you might, you see this uh, picture. Um, you see um, basically that that's just to show you uh, how this uh, resolution mismatch works. And basically, when you increase the uh, resolution, you can see, for example, the green line has a much higher resolution than the blue line. Um, and you see that when you increase the resolution, uh, you can see you can resolve these kind of wiggles in the gravity waves. And so th this is the idea we are exploiting, the idea that a high resolution, uh, high resolution run will contain information that is not in the forecast, and then we can mix the two to via, via the observations. Um, so I said we use an ensemble common filter, so um, I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, this type of uh, data simulation schemes. Um, uh, generally speaking, I would say they are split into two uh, steps. So one is the forecast step, and the forecast step is when the, all the uh, fluid dynamics is happening. So I have a model, 
um, I'm integrating the model in time. And then I have a moment in which do I do the uh, data simulation. And so that, that's called the analysis step in doing which I combine my model state with some observations. And exactly as I mentioned before, you see also in this uh, picture, which is uh, from a paper from Carassi, 2018, um, the, see how the observations is much closer to the truth than the model. And then you find uh, this uh, in-between state, which is uh, generally called the analysis. Um, so I have a, and then, uh, uh, yeah, so then the analysis basically becomes your new initial condition to run again the model for another forecast step, and you repeat this. And that's why also these type of schemes are also called sequential schemes, because there is one moment in which you do the, the in which you assimilate the observations, and then just there is another moment during which you just integrate the model forward. Now, this is a, just a slide with uh, some equations. Um, I think the important thing in this slide is uh, these uh, two equations at the center in the analysis step. So this is the Kalman filter equation. And in the Kalman filter equation, which is a linear filter, so there is a linear relationship between basically, um, there is a linear assumption behind the, 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 the Kalman filter. And the, what, the way you, we combine the, um, the forecast with the observations is uh, through this uh, Kalman gain matrix K. And the Kalman gain matrix K is in turn, in turn depends on basically PF and R. So PF and R are covariance matrices. And basically they contain the information about the uncertainties um, um, conveyed by the uh, model state and the observations. Now, in this presentation, I would like to focus more on the uh, covariance, um, or covariance uh, matrix for the model state, so this PF. Um, also because in an ensemble common filter, this matrix PF is basically estimated at every, at every analysis step using the uh, ensemble. So we said we run an ensemble of model forecasts and we use those, that ensemble to estimate the, the uncertainty basically of the uh, model state. And that uncertainty is, uh, of course, then uh, contained. The information about that uncertainty is contained in this covariance matrix PF. Now, this is just to show you how this type of uh, filters work. So in this plot, uh, on the right, you see, uh, sorry, on the left, you see uh, the model state before the assimilation. And on the left, you see the model state, uh, basically the analysis. So the uh, model plus the observations. Um, so the variables H, U and R, so the well, the um, fluid depth is the, the top panels, the velocity is the uh, middle panel, and the rain is the bottom panel. Um, and so in each panel, you see uh, there are uh, these uh, uh, tiny lines, these um, light lines, blue lines, which are the um, member of the ensemble. And then you have the red line, which is the forecast the green line, which is the uh, nature run, and the, gr the, the green dots, which are the observations. And on the right, you see the light blue line, which is the analysis. Now, the idea here is that I want to push uh, the, um, the red line, which is the ensemble mean, towards the green line, which is the nature run. And I want to do it with the observations, which is this, um, these uh, green dots. So in this case, for example, there is this peak in the nature run, which is not really seen by the forecast. Well, it's seen only partially by the forecast. But I have an observations which is right there. And I can see, uh, you can see that um, after the assimilation, so after that the information about this observation is, um, is uh, taken, then the analysis is, is really doing, um, is doing better than the forecast. And it's much closer to the nature run than the forecast was. And in a sense, you can see the same on the bottom panel for R. But the difference is, is here that there is no observation in our right where you have the peak. But what we can, for example, see, um, this is um, the um, covariance matrix I mentioned before, uh, normalized, the normalized covariance matrix. You see, though, that in this, in this case, there would be um, corre um, high correlation between H and R, which is shown in this band here. And so that's why that that's how the ensemble common filter works really. So the uh, the fact that we are exploiting the uh, um, covariance matrix uh, PS, um, even if we don't have the observation, that is still beneficial to the system, and we can have an improvement 
um, an improved state uh, even without the observation. Now I'm almost at 15 minutes, so I'm gonna uh, briefly say that um, the so the, the the objective of running all these uh, experiments after that we developed the model was basically show that the uh, our our idealized system was relevant for numerical weather prediction data simulation. Now this table don't don't focus on uh, anything in particular here. Just th the idea here was that, and the novelty of our study was that we were trying to do this in a very systematic way. So we were saying, okay, what's, what's the characteristic of an operational system that we want to mimic? And we have, this, we have done this work with this table in which we say, well, this is what an operational system generally has. What does our idealized system have? And so we were trying to say which, uh, of, the, which of these were relevant and which of these were not. Um, and for example, just to, to pick one, we after we ran all the our um, our experiments, we found, for example, that the error doubling time uh, of um, of a, of our system is in the same order of mag in the range of order of magnitude that we can we also find in a in a, a high resolution operational numerical weather prediction model. And so that was just to show you what was the idea behind the study. So being very, uh, trying to find link, tight links between what an operational system has and what our idealized system was able to mimic. And I, was, I will only mention in one slide that we are now trying to use this system to do satellite data simulation for the reasons I said before, satellites are important in the operational systems. Um, of course, this needs some adjustments, adjustments to the model, adjustments to the observing system, and also a new observation operator, which I haven't mentioned really, but uh, it's just a way to map the uh, model state into the, sorry, the, yeah, the model state into the observation space. But again, we are doing this with, in, with the idea that we have to make our uh, setup relevant for what we are studying. And so all these adjustments are made uh, again with that in mind. Okay, so I'm going to the conclusion. So uh, as I said, we developed in Leeds this uh, modified shallow water model and that was kind of an in-between option between using something very close to the operational system or very far from the operational system. Um, we we ran a series of experiments to prove that our uh, model was, uh, despite being idealized, was relevant for what we were studying and the results show that that relevance is there. And, and also we have done this in a very systematic way. And in the end, we are also trying to do some more research, uh, more focused research on a, on a subset of data simulation, which is satellite data simulation. And that's the end. So I will take any question you have for me.